As the data populates the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center map, it's easy to understand how this particular tool for visualizing the spread of COVID-19 has become so influential in shaping how the public and policymakers understand the current pandemic. The JHU coronavirus map has been a prop at White House news conferences and a background behind news anchors' desks. As its menacing red circles have grown to cover more of the globe, it's become one of the most important data visualizations in the history of journalism. It also helps that by design, it can be easily embedded into other online media platforms so that sites for both national and local news display the latest information from Johns Hopkins. Users can easily drill down into the information on the site to pinpoint geographical locations with outbreaks more precisely. The map has become so popular that unscrupulous scammers have created lookalike programs that can access and steal sensitive data. When unsuspecting users open infected email attachments or click online advertisements that seem to be sharing an authentic version of this interactive map. The FAQ links to a link for reporting such imitators. Looking closely at the acknowledgments in the lower right corner of the main JHU coronavirus map, you might also notice the presence of ESRI, the Environmental Systems Research Institute, a major digital cartography company that dominates the market in GIS software. Although free accounts that allow students to create story maps can be available through university licenses, Esri is a for-profit company that has benefited from the way that the coronavirus has drawn so much attention to digital mapping projects, as the landing page of its website shows. In thinking about where the map comes from and who produced it, it's worth noting that the Center for System Science and Engineering from Johns Hopkins serves as the main sponsor. They provide more information about how the mapping project originated and how it is responding to a fluid situation in which emergence in China was followed by hotspots all around the world. In looking at these coronavirus maps, it's often useful to ask questions about how open the data is. For example, with this map from the World Health Organization, it is possible to download the data that populates the map easily into the form of a spreadsheet. This kind of download from an information visualization allows data journalists to remix or mash up this content for new kinds of nonfiction digital storytelling. Of course, because concerns about the virus come close to home, many news consumers are most concerned about how their own geographical regions might be potential danger zones. We can see how the Virginia Department of Health has produced a map that represents infections in the state. From the corporate branding visible below the map, you can see that the imagery is generated using software from Tableau, an American interactive data visualization software company created by former Stanford researchers which is now based in Seattle, Washington. In 2009, Salesforce acquired Tableau, although it still offers some free products through its open downloads available to the general public. Like Esri, Tableau has made its coronavirus mapping a selling point for the company. Downloading the data from the Virginia Department of Health site used to be much easier for other communicable diseases than for COVID-19. And the Tableau download links only worked for PDFs or PowerPoint slides that obscured the actual numbers. But as the epidemic has progressed, the site's designers seem to have become more sensitive to the needs of data journalists. It's much easier to download spreadsheets from the site now, and they've added a map that identifies different kinds of community transmission, including at places like nursing homes and correctional facilities. They've also added information about racial disparities, disparities about gender, and disparities of age. Sites for open source sharing of data and programming code like GitHub provide troves of material for data journalists or others doing DIY visualization. Of course, it helps to have specialized computer science or data science knowledge to effectively create maps and interactive visualizations. 
and many might argue that medical or public health knowledge is needed to interpret the numbers in any meaningful way. But advocates for solving society's challenges with new digital technologies seem to remain optimistic about the promise of the open data movement. There are even machine learning tutorials that crowdsource ways to refine diagnostic algorithms for detecting COVID infections based on lung x-rays. Using its professional staff of visualization designers, the New York Times has been one of the most visible venues for data journalism about the coronavirus. It's useful to think about how this newspaper of record deploys animation and mouse over effects in order to communicate or enhance news coverage. For example, a story about possible patterns of infection might seem more menacing as an animation of color spreading across the map than it might as a sequence of images representing discrete time periods, particularly when so much about the future of the impact of the disease is so uncertain. It's interesting to see how the New York Times structures its more speculative stories in which readers are encouraged to exercise their agency in testing out different possible scenarios or to explore a story by running their own simulations. Notice how a simple model of digital physics like collision detection appears in the New York Times coronavirus coverage. Although it is visually very striking, the programming might actually be relatively simple. This is the kind of simulation that many programming tutorials teach, as in the case of this programming tutorial for the language processing, which is using Box 2D. Of course, the New York Times isn't the only data journalism operation covering the coronavirus for a major organization. Other examples are certainly worth analyzing. So please send me examples that you might think are noteworthy for us all to think about the politics of information visualization, open data, and digital storytelling. Additional thanks to Professor Lev Manovich for providing many of the examples cited in this video.